Hi everyone, welcome to the Ditch the Diet podcast. I am your host, Rachel Watson. podcast is for people all over the world who want to learn how to quit yo-yo dieting and start living a healthy lifestyle without restriction. Say goodbye to food guilt and start improving your relationship with food. Um, This podcast is sponsored by the Ditch the Diet Academy, which is the membership site that I run and it's your alternative to a lifetime of slimming clubs where we teach you the exact steps to take to learn how to quit yo-yo dieting forever, improve your relationship with food and get your body confidence back. You can check us out at ditchthedietacademy.com. Um, so in this episode, I am talking to Dr. Rongan Chatterjee. We are talking about his brand new book, The Stress Solution. If you haven't heard of Dr. Chatterjee yet, he is a medical doctor with a specialist interest in lifestyle medicine and bringing lifestyle medicine to the forefront of his practice. He is also the author of two books, The Four Pillar Plan and his new book, The Stress Solution, which you can find on Amazon right now. And in this interview, we cover topics Um, ranging from nutrition, uh, how to use food to improve your health, but we also cover the subject of stress and its impact on health and uh, practical strategies that you can put into place in your own life to help you to improve your stress levels and therefore improve your health. So without any further rambling from me, here is the interview with Dr. Chatterjee and I'll be back at the end to tell you a little bit more about where you can find out more about what he does and a little bit more about the Ditch the Diet Academy. Uh, I thought we would uh, start by just um, for those of those listeners that are listening right now that are perhaps not sure who you are and what you do, I thought it'd be a good place to start just by telling me a little bit about your background and sort of how you first became interested in lifestyle medicine as a, a sort of add-on approach to your medical background, I suppose. Yes, so um, I guess the first place to start is I'm a medical doctor, so I've been a practicing doctor for nearly 20 years now, and I've done quite a variety of things in my career. I first started off in hospital medicine, I did all my specialist exams, I was going to be a a nephrologist, you know, um, and that's basically kidney medicine, Mm -hmm. Um, but I was getting a little bit, you know, a little bit, I wouldn't say concerned, but I was a little bit frustrated with how specialized we were becoming in medicine and I thought a little bit overly specialized and I felt that for me I didn't want to spend my whole career just seeing kidney issues I wanted to see everything I want to see the whole body and so I moved to general practice in my exams for that and have been practicing maybe for about 10 years or so as a GP um, and I guess you know the more I practice the more patients I see the more I start to become aware that we're very good with acute illness. You know, we've got magic bullet drugs that can that can be really powerful and really helpful for acute problems. Like you come in with a pneumonia, which is the overgrowth of some bugs in your lung. We can give you something to kill those bugs, and before you know it, that problem, touch wood, has gone away, and you are better. But when we try and apply that same principle to chronic illness. I just found that we weren't really, I wasn't getting the same results as a doctor. I was finding it incredibly frustrating. I felt I was handing out a load of pills day in, day out. And one day I sat there at the end of my GP practice, I looked through the whole list and I thought, how many patients have I really helped today? And I honestly felt it was maybe 20% of my patients who I really helped. The other 80%, sure, I'd done something. I may have ordered a test, referred them on, given them a pill, but... I didn't feel like I actually understood what was going on, got to the root cause, and therefore I was able to help my patients long term, you know, learn how to get better. And that was really frustrating for me. So that really was one of the big turning points that led me down this path. Um, Some of your listeners may uh, know that I've done uh, a series of primetime BBC One documentaries called Doctor in the House, where I, you know, a really lucky opportunity for me, you know, I feel incredibly fortunate to have had that chance to to go and spend four to six weeks with families all around the UK who were struggling with health problems, Mm -hmm. whether it was um, problems, you know, with with fibromyalgia, type 2 diabetes, anxiety, insomnia, gut problems, weight problems, fatigue, it doesn't really matter, I saw everything. 
But interestingly enough, all of these families were either already under doctors, whether GPs or specialists, and were already on medications. And despite that, they still didn't feel good in themselves. And that's a very common story these days. So I went and spent four to six weeks with these families. And I've got to say, these are the proudest results of my entire career, you know, helping a lady reverse her type 2 diabetes in 30 days, a change that has proved sustainable three years on without any input from me, without any input from the NHS. Mm -hmm. She has been empowered to, you know, keep her type 2 diabetes in remission. A lady with fibromyalgia who had had it for 10 years, she was on 20 pills a day in six weeks. I got her pain free and two years on, she's now on zero pills a day. Panic and anxiety sat down by 70%. Insomnia got better. Someone who had energy problems for his whole adult life, we, I managed to determine that he had a genetic abnormality where his homocysteine was elevated and by giving him some supplementation, we were able to transform his health in just a few days. And so I, I'm really interested in looking for the root cause of my patient's problems. And today in the 21st century, I've got to tell you that in 80% of the cases that come in to see me, they are in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles. I'm very keen to say I'm not putting blame on people. I get it. It is very, very hard to live in a way that's in harmony with our genetic heritage in the modern world. So I'm not putting blame on people. So I think we've got to be careful when we use the term lifestyle medicine or lifestyle change. Often um, we are, you know, we're often, without realizing it, making people feel as though, oh, have I done this to myself? No, I don't think people have done it to themselves at all. But what I do think is that lifestyle, when you personalize lifestyle interventions, no matter what your condition is, you can always improve something. Um, you know, sometimes you can get off medication. Sometimes it will just help you manage your condition a little bit better. And sometimes you'll be able to reverse your condition completely. And so I think it's not about lifestyle only being you know, a way of preventing getting ill in the future, lifestyle can actually help us when we do get out, improve our health. Mm -hmm. I think that's, it gives people hope, doesn't it? And that, um, uh, just to give you an example, I was diagnosed with anxiety, really bad anxiety about 15 years ago as a result of gut problems that I was having. And back then, sort of 15 years ago, I felt really um, almost like I, I just have to learn to live with this now. Like this is it. So I spent like the best part of the next decade trying to learn to live with it until I found, um, stumbled across a podcast actually about five years ago, um, a nutritional therapist talking about, you know, the, the power of things like the, what we eat, how we sleep, um, all of these things that was just starting to emerge back then. Um, and I just kind of did a little bit of digging myself, changed the way I ate slightly, just gradually realized that there was just that little spark of hope there that had come back after such a long time. And I think um, for a lot of people listening, they, they may be, you know, where I was 15 years ago or possibly suffering with one of the conditions that you've mentioned that may feel like I felt like this is it. Um, this is how I have to live now. I have to just learn to live with it. But that's not always the case. And I like the fact that... Um, the, the type of the type of education that you provide for people through your books and through the, the TV series has given people hope uh, that there is. Yeah, we all need hope, and uh, thank you for sharing your story. I mean, it, without hope, what have we got? Because, you know, I, I, I've reflected a lot recently over the patients that I've seen over the last, um, well, 17 and a half years, I guess now. And, you know, one of the worst things I think for a patient is when they feel that they've got no control over what happens. You know, they've been struck down by a condition and the doctor says, there's nothing you can do. You have to take this medication. That's the way it is. And I just think it's no way to live for, for anyone. It's, it's, really, um, it's really debilitating. It's really, really demoralizing for anyone. And one, one thing I always try and provide for any one of my patients, I, I try and provide hope and a bit of inspiration and say, hey, look, you can make the smallest change in the world, actually, and you may not think that's going to do much, but it really it really can do. Let me help you. Let me figure out in your lifestyle, what can you do in your lifestyle? And this is where I like to move away from generic public health advice, which, of course, has has a role to play. But I mean, take an example. You know, a few years ago, I remember telling a patient in my uh, practice, I was reading all the latest research on the importance of lean muscle mass and how once we get past the age of 30, 
if we're sedentary, we lose a significant amount of lean muscle mass every year. Mm -hmm. And lean muscle mass is critical for our well-being as we age. In fact, it's probably one of the most powerful predictors of how well you're going to be as you get older. Yet when we talk about exercise, everyone's talking about walking, which is great. Everyone's talking about cardio, again, which is great. But we're not really talking about strength training. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I saw a patient, a young guy, and I thought, hey, you know, this is really relevant for you. And I said to him, you know, it's really important you focus on lean muscle mass. It'll help you with your blood sugar. It'll help you with your your weight. It'll help you with your energy and concentration. Because what, what, about 30, 40 minutes, three times a week? I said, that'd be great if you can do that. Yeah. And he said, okay, I'm going to go and join the gym. Mm -hmm. Came out four weeks later. And what was really interesting is I said, how are you getting on? And he said, I don't, you know, life's been busy, work's been stressful, the gym's not nearby, it's actually quite a lot of money, I've not really done any of it. Mm -hmm. and, and in that moment, I, I didn't think, why has he not done what I've asked him to do? I never think about it, actually. I thought, okay, I've clearly not given him advice that he feels is relevant in the context of his life. And in that moment, I created something called a five-minute kitchen workout, which I sort of showed on the Doctor of the House series. It was in my first book, The Four Pillar Plan, and people love it because I took my jacket off in the consultation room. I said, right, okay, let me just teach you a strength training workout right here, right now. And, you know, what, what's so great about it is that you don't need to get changed. You don't need to join a gym. You don't need to buy any equipment. And what's really interesting is I said to him, look, can you give me five minutes twice a week to do this workout in the kitchen? So what is that all? So yeah, just five minutes twice a week. And so he goes away, I teach him it, uh, and he does it. He comes up four weeks later, I say, how are you getting on? And he said, oh, I love it, I absolutely love it. I started off doing it five minutes twice a week. Now I do it for about 10 minutes every single day. <laughs> so my strategy for engaging people in behavior change is to try and find something that they feel is achievable keep the bar really low so that they can achieve it. And then, you know, we like ticking boxes as humans. We like feeling that we've achieved what we've set out to do. So by completing his five minutes twice a week, he felt motivated enough to keep doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. Well, when I talk to my patients about meditation, I say, okay, you, you can't find 10, 15 minutes there. Fine. Can you do two minutes? All right. Make a commitment. You're going to do two minutes every day at the same time. And you know what happens? Those two minutes... After a week, they become five minutes, and they become ten minutes, and before you know it, you've created a new habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you started off really small, and I think particularly, you know, particularly in January, you know, everyone's looking for that that savior, that new diet that somehow is going to work this year in a way that it never worked before. And you know, I understand why these things are in such high demand because there's a lot of people out there who aren't feeling great, who are feeling sick, who do want help with their health, so they're looking for that quick fix. But you know what, there ain't a quick fix. It's about making small changes consistently, and it really does build up to the, to the big health outcomes in the long term. That's it, exactly. And I think especially around the Janu around January time, not just January, but in particular, um, it's the sort of overhaul uh, process that a lot of people go through. And it's like, right, I'm, I'm going to, overhaul absolutely everything all at the same time only to become disheartened you know a couple of weeks down the line when it all sort of comes crashing down again um, and yep. I love the I love the idea of uh, the thought process of you know don't don't start with the big overhaul start with the little tiny things that are going to add up over the course of maybe 12 months two years three years but it's it is hard to get into that way of thinking I think when you are um, at that stage where you're really desperate to feel better um, to try and break it down into those small steps can be quite uh, quite a hard thing to get your head around especially in this instant gratification sort of world that we live in where everything's at the, the sort of click of a finger <laughs> these days um, uh, you, you, I think you've heard the nail ahead there we, we're living in a world aren't we where we're so used to getting everything we want when we want it you know mm. even, even if you want to buy anything now you can literally go on your computer go on Amazon and it'll be with you the following morning. We've never, I don't think in human evolution, ever been able to acquire things with such ease. Mm. And it's funny, I spoke to my cousin the other day, who's in his mid-twenties, and he said to me, Robin, well, yeah, I think, I think I've got really impatient now. You know, I expect everything to be done. And I get really frustrated if something doesn't arrive when, when it's meant to arrive. And I think, wow, you know, before Amazon, we never had that 
you know, it's just crazy. We never would even expect things to be there the following day. I know. Uh, but it's, uh, and so I think why would we not expect the same with our health? Because, um, you know, I guess in many ways it's just a reflection of culture. Um, but, I, but I do believe actually that the small changes can make you feel good in the short term as well as the long term. I think the small changes, though, are much more likely to be still helping you in six months' time, in 12 months' time, in 18 months' time. Whereas, you know, anybody, frankly, can go on a two week diet and feel great. It, it's just the reality is we can all motivate ourselves for two weeks to go on something, lose a bit of weight, feel good, see our skin better, see our energy levels go up. That's great, but what I'm interested in is how can that change still be there in two months, in two years, not just for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, you know, I've been amazed with, um, I've seen the background there, you've got my book there on the right hand of the screen, not my, yeah, my first book, The Four Pillar Plan, which um, I, I'm really amazed with how much of an impact that's had on the public, but also on the medical profession, because, mm -hmm. you know, I just set out what I thought was a really simplified template to help people gain control over their lives by not only focusing on one area, by saying, hey, you know what, my diet might be good enough. Maybe I don't need to worry about the extra 5 10% that where I could improve my diet. Maybe I'm better off focusing on going to bed one hour early each night. You know, really trying to take this rounded approach. And not a week, not really a day goes by where I don't hear a new story from someone who's read the book. I was in London last week, and I got stopped just after I got off at Houston. And um, it was a really, really polite lady. She said, I'm sorry, it's body doctor. I just, uh, I just really want to um, let you know something. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And she said, look, I've been on painkillers for 20 years, and I've not managed to come off them. They're just going up. And literally, I've been applying the principles in your book um, for the last three months. I've come off all of them. I'm actually on no painkillers anymore. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how, you know, I really get almost a bit teary thinking about that. It's just incredible to think that, what I think I outlined in that book was just the, the core principles of good health. They apply to everyone. If, you, if you've already got a condition like type 2 diabetes or chronic pain or an autoimmune condition, you know, applying those principles is going to help you manage that condition better. If you're trying to prevent getting sick in the future, the principles in that book will help prevent you getting sick. Mm -hmm. And if you simply are sick and tired of needing caffeine and sugar to get you through each and every single day, they're the same principles. I did not invent the principles of good health. They've always been around. They're the same principles that were there 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. The only thing that's changed is the modern environment. And therefore, in, in many ways, it's just a little reminder of going back to basics mm -hmm. and really simplifying and broadening out the conversation beyond the food. You know, I'm a huge fan of changing our diets. And, and again, if you were interviewing me five or six years ago and you asked me what is the single biggest cause of um, most of the patients who come to see you, I would say food, no question. Mm -hmm. But actually, I've changed my mind. I've actually evolved my view. If you ask me now, I'd say I genuinely think it's stress because I feel that it's such a stressed out culture that we're living in where many of us are go, go, go the whole time. We've always got competing demands. Our to-do lists are never done. We're checking work emails on a Saturday, on a Sunday. We might have elderly parents to look after the school run to do. Families might have two working parents who aren't around as much as they possibly used to be to spend time with their children and the guilt that then comes along with that. It's everywhere. I often find that our food choices can be a compensation for our stress level. So because we're so hyper-stressed, we go for the sugary treat. You know what? It makes us feel good for 15, 20 minutes. We feel that temporary relief. And so I found more and more that when I'm asking patients to change their diet, yes, some people are motivated and they can do it. Some people are trying their best, yet they're just unable to. And I'm finding more and more that when I go to their stress levels, figure out what's going on in their life, and, and address their stress levels, I think it's much easier for people to change their diets. Yeah, I completely agree with that um, on all that in all aspects but um, oh, it's, um, so, so stress stress is a big problem in our current society um, in the modern lifestyle that we the modern you know world that we live in and there are a lot of positives of that but there are also a lot of negatives could, could you explain to me what the definition of stress is and why perhaps it's so important that we address it yeah absolutely I mean I think you, you just highlighted, you said that stress is a big problem for all of us. 
the World Health Organization agree with you. The World Health Organization say that stress is the health epidemic of the 21st century. Now, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible that such a uh, prestigious and global organization are coming out so publicly like that. Mm. And I think, I think they need to, because I think many of us, although it's common parlance now, you know how you're doing, yeah, yeah, I'm good, yeah, a little bit stressed, but not too bad. You know, every single day we will hear the word stress or stress because we all say it and we all hear it from our friends and our family. Uh, so what is stress? You know, it's, it's, it's really important that we understand that stress is not all bad. In fact, the stress response turns us into the most powerful version of ourselves. But our stress, evolved in a very, our stress response evolved in a very different era. You know, our stress response evolved several million years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, in a nutshell, to help us um, to help keep us safe from danger. So in the, you know, the olden hunter-gatherer days, if we were being attacked by an animal, our body's stress response would basically switch on. We'd go into fight or flight. Hormonal changes would happen in the body, which would help us you know, run away or fight that animal and basically keep ourselves out of danger and keep us safe. So what happens in that moment? Well, all kinds of things happen. Um, sugar gets chucked into our bloodstream, which is a great thing because it means we can run faster. Mm-hmm. Our mental alertness goes up, so we're more, um, we're more, you know, our awareness is heightened for any other threat that might be around us. Um, you know, we shut off processes that actually our body deems non-essential in that moment. So things like libido. You know, if you're running away from a tiger, you don't need to be able to chill out and actually procreate with your partner. <laughs> you know, that's, that's an unnecessary process. Your digestion in that moment is an unnecessary process. So there's a whole series of biological processes that kick into gear when we're stressed, and they actually help us in the short term, but they can be harmful in the long term. And that's the key. So if we just take those few examples I, I used, Sugar comes pouring into your bloodstream, which helps you run away. That's fine if it's going on for 30 minutes or an hour or two to get you away from danger. But if you're getting stressed out day in, day out, that same process is happening. So that sugar that's coming to your bloodstream all of a sudden has negative consequences. It means you'll have low energy, you'll put on weight, you'll probably develop high blood pressure, and ultimately you'll develop type 2 diabetes because your stress response has not been switched off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the short term, a little bit of stress helps us think clearly. So if you've got a presentation to do, if you're you're speaking uh, live on stage somewhere, if you've got an exam, that stress helps us think clearly. That's brilliant. In the long term, that increased stress response, those increased cortisol levels, cortisol is one of the body's primary stress response hormones, that starts to damage your hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain. So in the short term, it helps your brain. In the long term, that stress kills nerve cells in your brain, which is why, uh, which is a link to getting Alzheimer's in later age. But it's also one of the reasons why we're seeing so many people, particularly at a younger age, just having issues with concentration and memory because we are overloaded the whole time, and our stress response is not switching off. Talk about libido. Libido is, you know, a lack of libido is on the rise. I see that pretty much every day as a GP. Someone's coming complaining for lack of libido. Mm -hmm. Once you understand the stress response, you understand that actually um, the precursor to all hormones in the body, or most hormones, is something called LDL cholesterol. And that LDL cholesterol can really follow, you know, this is really oversimplifying things, but can kind of follow two paths. One path makes cortisol, the other path makes things like estrogen, testosterone, and what we call the sex steroid hormones. Mm -hmm. So why is that important? If you're not stressed, that LDL cholesterol gets beautifully partitioned off to cortisol and estrogen and testosterone in the correct amounts. If you're stressed all the time, basically, most of the resource in your body goes to making cortisol, which means there's less left to make testosterone, to make estrogen, so over time, Things like your libido goes down. You have hormonal problems. Now, in medicine, we will treat those things with hormones. Of course, that has value, but that's a downstream treatment. I don't mind that, but I say also, I want to tell the patient, hey, look, but in the long term, we need to address your stress levels because then if we do, 
actually the hormones are going to take care of themselves. And so for me, you know, as a doctor, I see problems every day in my surgery, low energy, insomnia, anxiety, a lack of focus, lack of libido, gut problems like RBS, type 2 diabetes, insomnia, high blood pressure. All of these seem a little bit different. They seem seemingly unrelated. But all of them, every single one of them at their root cause has stress as a key, key driver. And I can tell you, you know, this was far worse today than it was even, you know, 17 and a half years ago when I qualified. Mm -hmm. This has gone up in that time dramatically. And, you know, the modern day equivalent of that lion attacking us is overload. So we're getting stressed out by our modern lives. You know, we're no longer getting stressed out by tigers. We're getting stressed out by our lives. And that's having a, a, a really significant consequence on our health. So, so stress is a good thing when in the right amounts. Yeah. And uh, you, talk, you talk about um, something that I found really interesting. And actually, as I was reading it, um, just over the weekend there, I was like sitting nodding my head and nodding my head thinking, oh my goodness. I got to do something about this. And that was um, micro stress doses. I found this really interesting. Um, so all the little triggers that are happening throughout your day that I didn't even realise were happening. But as I was reading it, I thought, that's happening to me. That's happening to me. And yeah, it was like someone had just switched on a light bulb in my head. And I thought, oh, I need to discuss yes. this with you. Um, so what are, what are micro stress doses? Yeah, you know, so... <laughs> Um, first of all, I'm really glad it resonated with you because that was the whole idea. You know, when I sat down to write this book, I thought pretty much what you said right at the start, really, which is, you know, stress is is just endemic. We all know about it, but how am I going to articulate it in a way that actually someone's going to read that and go, okay, I need to do something about this. You know, this is relevant for me. So I really try to start the, the book off with a life in the day off to really try and show people that, mm -hmm. you know, how how prevalent stresses in every aspect of our lives. And so, you know, but, you know, I've also got to be aware that there are some really significant traumatic stress episodes that can happen in our life. Um, and I really want to make a differentiation. So I, I came up with this concept of micro stress doses and macro stress doses. So micro stress doses, for example, might be something really traumatic. You know, it could be abuse as a child. It could be you were um, yeah, adopted, you had a broken home, um, you know, your parents went through um, a traumatic breakup, all kinds of things that actually are significant insults and actually a lot of our behaviours change as a result of that. Um, and often, you know, definitely the principles in the book will help people like that for sure because when you've got one of those macro stress doses, taking care of their micro stress doses becomes even more important. <laughs> but, but I also recognize that a lot of those people will, will benefit from actually talking about those and seeing a therapist who can help them process some of that. So I contrast that with micro stress doses, which are, you know, little things like, you know, you try to get ready in the morning, you're running late, that's a micro stress dose. Um, you put the toast on if, if you eat bread, which many of us don't these days, but if you do, you know, and, and the toast burns, you're like, ah, breakfast is, you know, I try to, I try to be quick, but the breakfast is burnt. Your kids aren't out of bed, you're trying to get them to school. Um, you know, you're, you're waking up, you're in a deep slumber at 6.30 in the morning, let's say. And you get woken up by this loud, blaring alarm. That's a micro stress dose. You pick it up. First thing you see is your is your phone. You switch it. You you switch the alarm off, and then you see. Oh, I've got ten emails. I've got four text messages. Three WhatsApp messages. Oh, someone's commented on my latest Instagram post, etc., etc., etc. And I'm trying to make the case that before you have even left the house, many of us are, are, are looking at between ten and twenty micro stress doses, and. Really, what I'd love people to understand is that we've all got a personal threshold. We've got our own personal stress threshold. So, you know, we can cope. We're pretty resilient people. We can cope with stress up to a point. Mm -hmm. uh, but once we cross our threshold, we suddenly lose it. You know, we we get overly reactive, overly emotional. We start to shout at the people closest to us. Uh, we get worked up by things that we've got no control over, and. I want to help people identify what are the micro stress doses in their life, but then what can they do to help reduce them? Ideally, eliminate them. But I can't, you know, I can't change the amount of stresses in someone's life, but I can give them tools that are going to help them get on top of them. And that's really what my book is about to say hey, look, stress exists. 
a lot of this stuff is here to stay, but what can you do? What are simple and accessible things that you can do? These are things that I have fabricated in my mind. These are things that, you know, in all my years of clinical practice, I have seen these strategies work in real life with busy people, with busy jobs, with busy family lives. You know, I, you know, I could sit here and say, look, ideally we could all do with doing an hour of yoga each day, one hour of meditation, one hour walk in nature. You know what, those things are great, but who's going to be able to do them in real life? Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to do in my first book, The Four Pillar Plan, but also in a new one, The Stress Solution, is really go, these are achievable things that you can do. I'm also trying to shed a light on some areas that people may not have thought of when they think about stress. Most people think about emotional stress, Mm -hmm. but there are many other things in the modern world that are a source of stress as well. Yeah, that's what I was actually going to ask you about next. So when we when we're actually talking about the word stress and feeling stressed, it's not just about that feeling of I feel stressed, as in I feel uh, possibly a bit worked up, panicky, heart's racing. That's not just what stress actually means and what stress actually is. There are lots of other different things that are contributing to the stress that our body is under such as, you know, things like environmental stress, nutritional stress, um, relationship stress, but, you know, lots of lots of little things that all add up. Um, would you agree yeah, with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. There are, you know, emotional stress is just, you know, when like, you've, you've got your overload, it's just one source of stress. The food that we eat can be a huge source of stress in the body. A lack of sleep can be a huge source of stress on the body. You know, when you don't sleep, you know, you, you have problems with memory, attention, cognitive function, your ability to make decisions, your ability to learn things. And that is a huge stress on the body. You know, what's really interesting about sleep, actually, is there is a part of our brain called the amygdala. And this is really important because it's our emotional brain. So, you know, when, you know, many of us know this feeling when we're quite stressed, we, we get overly reactive to certain things, something that wouldn't normally stress us out suddenly becomes a big deal and a big problem and we just escalate and it becomes bigger and bigger. And basically, when you haven't slept, uh, I, can't, I think it's when you slept six hours as opposed to eight hours, your amygdala is about 25% more reactive than it would have been. That's incredible. That's your emotional brain being you know, 25%, a quarter more reactive just from not sleeping enough. I think we all know that intuitively, you know, when we've woken up and we haven't slept particularly well or for particularly long, you know, what are your relationships like with your partner, with your children, with your work colleagues? You know, how grounded do you feel? What food do you want to eat when you're not set well? Mm-hmm. You know, sleep deprivation changes your hormones so you feel more hungry and you feel less full. That's hormones leptin and ghrelin. They, they get flipped. So, you know, it's impossible, well, it's very challenging to make those healthy food choices when you haven't slept. So not only is the lack of sleep a stress on the body, the subsequent lifestyle and food choices you make because you've not slept are also a huge source of stress on the body. Um, so, you know, body, I, I split up, like I did in the Four Pillar Plan, my first book, in this one, I try and split up stress into four key areas. Just really, I'm always trying to simplify messaging so that, you know, people can understand, not in a patronizing way, but really just in a, in a way to say, oh, I get it, you know, it's these are the four, what I call stress super highways in the modern world. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of them is body, which is, you know, food, sleep, circadian rhythms, and how um, being stressed can impact those things, but also when you're not adopting the best food choices, the best sleep uh, hygiene, um, those things can also cause more stress. But there's another pillar, that, the, the, well, there's four pillars. One, one of them is, as I said, is body. Another one is relationships. So I feel that, you know, for many of us, we need to reprioritize our relationships as, as, we're, as the world is getting busier and busier, and we're supposedly more connected than ever before. I'm seeing a lot of loneliness in my practice. We know loneliness is, is on the rise. It's, it's an epidemic proportions now. And it's not just the elderly who are lonely living by themselves. You know, the, one of the biggest, one of the fastest rising groups of loneliness are men between the age of 30 and 40. Mm-hmm. You know, so we've got a lot of young people these days who are feeling hyper-connected digitally, but on a, on a human sense, on a real deep, meaningful human connection. We've never been this lonely. So, you know, I, I talk about the importance of human touch and how actually touch 
is as important for our bodies and our brains as food is. And that's quite quite a radical statement to make, but there's a whole chapter on touch in my new book. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to one of the leading uh, global researchers on human touch, Professor Francis McGlone from Liverpool John Moores University. And his research is incredible. We have got on our skin, we have got a special type of touch nerve fiber. It's called the C tactile outfit. The name doesn't matter, but what's really, really important about this is that it is maximally stimulated at a rate of three to five centimeters per second. Now, of course, you know, if you were to touch someone, I was to touch someone, you know, we're not going to measure our speed. This is the speed that a mother will intuitively stroke a baby at. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is hardwired within us. And those nerve fibers go from our skin all the way up to our brain, to our emotional brain. And when we simulate those touch nerve fibers, our cortisol levels, which are our, which is one of the primary stress response hormones in the body, they go down. So simple human touch will directly lower your stress levels, yet we become a touch-averse society. You know, we're, we're, for good reason, in, in many situations, of course, you know, we're too scared to touch people. It's not deemed appropriate anymore. Even me as a doctor, you know, 10 years ago, if I was giving bad news to someone, um, you know, I'd get in close, I'd sort of lower my tone, I'd probably put my arm on their shoulder just to sort of, you know, help break the bad news now. I'm petrified that actually, will that be misconstrued? Am I crossing a personal boundary? And so look, I get it. Inappropriate touch is clearly a source of stress. But I think, you know, really I just want to get that focus back on human touch a bit more, saying, you know, how many times have you actually had human touch mm -hmm. in life? Um, and I say in the book, keep the touch diary. By the end of the week, see if you can double it. By the end of the second week, see if you can triple it. And this is simple. You know, maybe girls and women do this a bit more intuitively than men, but for a lot of my male friends and male patients, I say, you know, next time you get together with your friends, you know, give each other a hug, you know. Um, next time you see your kids, you know, make an effort to really hug them. And this is not me trying to tell people what to do in their family lives. I'm just relaying experiences that I've had, both from the scientific research, but more importantly for me, in real-life clinical practice. Um, and people, you know, relationships, we talk about relationships between partners. Mm -hmm. Most of us these days are having uh, what I call in my book an eye affair with our smartphones um, in the sense that, you know, we, we're touching our phones probably more than we're touching our partners. <laughs> and on one level, you know, it's a bit messed up on one level, you know, um, because we're so distracted with technology where, yes, we are hyper-connected. So it's very common now for, to be around people um, and be distracted. So, you know, I may come home from work and my mind's still on work and I'm still trying to check my Instagram feed as I walk in through the door. My wife says hi, but I'm kind of distracted. So I'm not really having a meaningful interaction with her. Um, and so I, I sort of really try and touch on relationships and why why they're so important and how I think we have neglected them. I think we've lost intimacy in many of our relationships, both with our partners, um, but also um, you know, with our friends as well. And there's a whole chapter on friendship. And I really made the case that seeing our friends in real life is as in, you know, it is not a luxury for our health. It's an absolute necessity. And it's something that we're doing less and less these days because yes, we're busy, but I often wonder, is this because of social media as well? We sort of, we kind of feel we know what our mates are doing because we see their pictures, we see their holiday snaps, we, we see what their lives are. So actually we think, yeah, I need to see them in real life. I know, and um, then, uh, then like nine months goes past and you think, God, I'm not seeing... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I had a patient recently, a few months ago, um, he was a 40-year-old guy and... He was a successful business guy. You know, he was making good money. He was working for himself. You know, he was outwardly very successful. He came to see me because he was struggling. So unless he would feel low, he had poor concentration. Um, his Not only would his mood be low, his energy would often be low. He struggled to sleep sometimes. And he just wanted to check that there was nothing serious going on. So, yes, did his blood tests. He all came back normal. I started to delve into what was going on in his life, and it was absolutely incredible. Um, he was quite lucky. He lived in the same town that he grew up in, which many of us, of course, don't these days. So all his mates actually were around, but he hadn't seen any of his mates in real life for a good two or three months. 
And he was so busy, you know, making money, doing his job, you know, keeping up to date with his emails, blah, 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 like we all kind of justify in, in our own worlds. <laughs> and I said to him, look, um, there's nothing seriously wrong from the blood tests, but I think, I think, you know, all I'd love you to do for the next, two, the next sort of four to six weeks or so is once a week, I want you to see your friends um, in some setting. Well, it doesn't matter what it is, even if it's just for 10 minutes, see them. And put your phone up when you're there. Really be present in those interactions. And again, you might think, what's a doctor giving this kind of advice? What's that got to do with medicine? But he went away. He came back a few weeks later, like a, like a different man. I said, what did you do? He said, well, sometimes we'd go and play fireside. Sometimes it would just be we'd go down to the local cafe on a Sunday morning and catch a very real latte for half an hour, just chew the fat. Mm-hmm. But it didn't matter what it was. They just got together in person each week. And he came back and said, I'm like a different person. My mood's better. My energy's come up. I'm concentrating more at work. I'm more productive at work. And I'm sleeping better. And let's think about that. These are, he came in with symptoms. I could have easily medicated. I could easily have said, you know, this is a medical problem. But these were symptoms were a symptom of his lifestyle, mm-hmm. of his stress levels, by the fact that he wasn't prioritizing and nurturing his friendship. So I think... You know, for anybody listening to this podcast at the moment who feels that might apply to them, I challenge them, you guys, to literally, you know, pick up your phone and text someone right now, send them an email, even better, call them and put a date in the diary to see one of your friends in person. It's one of the fastest and best ways to lower your stress levels. And, you know, for me, as a, I, I realize as my career has got busier and busier over the last three or four years, particularly as I started appearing in the media loss, um, I realized that I've actually, without realizing it, I've under-prioritized my friendships, my really good friendships. A lot of my best mates from university, we all live hundreds of miles away from each other, Mm -hmm. but we have um, made a vow that twice a year we're going to get together for a golf weekend. Mm -hmm. And it's not the golf, actually. You know, that's just the glue that gets us there. Yeah. We're there. It's it's less about the golf. It's more about just hanging out, chewing the fat. Uh, And even if I go into that uh, feeling stressed out, tired, mentally and physically exhausted, I always come back feeling refreshed. And it's really taught me a lot that, you know, I've got to have those dates in the diary, uh, otherwise it just don't happen. And I think there's there's something we can all learn from that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I love that part of your book, actually, because um, I work uh, online, like my business is all online. I work pretty much on my own, you know, I have a couple of people that help me with various different things, but they're, you know, all over the country, so I don't see them. And sometimes, you know, in the not too distant past, I found myself, you know, going date, like two or three days where I've been working really hard. And I think to myself, God, I haven't even spoken, let alone spoken to anyone else in physical form for like a good couple of days. And it really does affect my mood like in a big way. Um, so um, when I read that, uh, when I read that section yesterday, I did, it did um, spark something uh, for me as well. So uh, I'll be making a much that's, bigger that's it. So I want this, yeah. you know, and the, the, the people who have read the book already, I mean, it's not, it's not out quite yet, but it's people who've read it. Um, it's amazing. They've all said to me, that just totally struck a chord deep within me and has really now mm-hmm. inspired me to think about my life in a different way. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a, I guess I'm an author now. It's really hard. You know, I feel like I'm a doctor, but I guess I've become <laughs> an author. Um, that's what you want, really. You want to connect with someone so they feel that it's well and firm. That's really what I do in my consultation room. I try and connect with the person in front of me. Mm-hmm. Just with books, you have to do that on a wider scale. Um, so I'm glad. I think that pill is going to get, you know, I think, I think it's really going to resonate with people. So I think we're all feeling that these days. And, you know, at the end of those weekends, I spoke with my friends. What's, what's amazing is I come back. Not only do I feel better, I'm a better husband when I come back. I'm a better father when I come back, you know, and, and that's the other thing which really fits in with what I talk about in the book, which is this whole idea that we're all living quite isolated lives. Now, you just mentioned how you, you know, how you live your professional life. You've got virtual people who help you, but often you're not seeing. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, 200 years ago, we lived around our families. You know, we lived near to people who could help us. Now we've all moved away. We're living by ourselves. We're doing all kinds of crazy work. Um, that actually, in many ways, is um, sorry. I think someone cleaning the windows outside as I speak. Sorry, I'm saying I got slightly distracted there. Um, but um, we're, we're basically 
we don't have those support networks around us. So many people, like let's say families are bringing up kids, both parents are working, they don't have support nearby, everyone's stressed out, and then we're expecting from our partner that we want them to be our best friends, our, our lover, our you know homemaker, whatever. You know, we expect all of it from our other half. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, it's unrealistic. That mm-hmm. I think seeing our friends is a big way to sort of reduce that stress. I think as culture has moved on and things like you know pubs and other meeting places are gradually closing down and getting eroded out of culture. We need new ways of getting together. And so I, I have a list in the book of things that people can do to almost become a regular themselves and not doing it at a pub. Yeah. Uh, but how can they do that? Whether it's local sports clubs, local hobbies, whether it's a book club, mm-hmm. um, whatever it is, just something that you do with other people in real life. Yeah. You know, not over the computer. You know, again, tech is brilliant. I'm not berating tech at all. I think it's fantastic. But I think, you know, we've got to remember that electronic communication it's not the same as human uh, human connection. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, one of the other uh, parts of your book that really sparked an interest for me and will also be really relevant to the people that listen to the podcast um, was a, a section where you talk about how to eat yourself happy. So I thought we could um, just, you know, briefly discuss that, um, you know, eating to reduce our stress, stress levels and improve you know, overall health. Um, could you explain what you mean, what you mean by eat, how to eat yourself happy? I know it's a, it's a broad topic. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, let me try and simplify this and keep it short. Um, <laughs> when we think of stress, we're often not thinking about foods, but the food that we eat can absolutely be a source of stress or a source of calm. And the reason is there's something called the gut-brain axis that we're starting to learn more and more about. So let's think about this. We've got our gut down in our body, we've got a brain at the top. Now, we used to think stress was just, you know, signals coming into our brain, so we've got deadlines or some, you know, a bad relationship or whatever, the stress, the stress coming into our brain. And then we've known that actually signals can go from your brain to your gut. You know, when people feel nervous, they might feel the urge to go to the toilet. So, you know, they're running sound, they're pressured for time, they feel an urge to go to the toilet. You know, so we know that our brain sends signals to our guts. But it works the other way as well, and that's really come in the last few years. We know that actually there are also communication highways between that go from our gut all the way up to our brain. Mm. And one of the ways you influence that is by the food that you eat. Now, there's multiple communication channels. Now, the names of those don't necessarily matter that much. One of them is the vagus nerve, which connects our guts to our brain. It's a long, winding nerve that goes through the body. And we know that if you eat the right kinds of foods you basically make something called short-chain fatty acids. Basically, um, your gut bugs, there are trillions of gut bugs that live inside us. It's called the, the gut microbiota. And when we talk about them in conjunction with their genes, we're called the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, there's sort of all the rage these days is to talk about a healthy gut. And, you know, are you feeding the right food for your gut bugs? But what does that really mean? Well, some scientists are calling our gut bugs our brain's peacekeepers. Because you keep your gut bugs happy, they will also keep your brain happy. It's really quite incredible. And it's, it's basically about how can we eat in a way that's going to promote the growth of good, strong, robust, healthy gut bugs, which in turn is going to send signals via multiple communication channels, including the vagus nerve, up to your brain to tell your brain, hey, everything's good, everything's calm. And one of the simplest ways you can do that is um, by eating a rich diversity of colorful plant foods, okay? So, you know, it's about basically, I call it in the book, eat the alphabet. Can you, per month, eat the alphabet? So, you know, there's a whole chart there of Mm -hmm. foods going from A all the way to Z in terms of what you can eat. And try really to promote that diversity because... A diversity of food promotes a diversity of gut bugs, and when you've got a diversity of gut bugs, you've got a strong, healthy, resilient microbiome. And so, you know, the research on this really is growing day by day. There's a, there's a very interesting trial that came out in uh, February 2017. Well, excuse me, it's got a bit dry out of the water. Um, it's called the SMILES trial, S-M-I-L-E-S. And it only has 67 people in it, but it was a randomized controlled trial. These are called the gold standard trials. 
And there was a group of patients with moderate to severe depression. They were already diagnosed, they were already under treatment. Now, one group was put on a modified Mediterranean diet um, with dietitian support. The other group, what was called the control group, had what's called social support. Mm -hmm. After 12 weeks, the group who changed their diet had a statistically significant remission rate from their depression. Remission. Wow. So 32% of the people in the, in, the, in the diet group had remission of their major depression compared to only 8% in the other group. Now, that was incredible. Now, yes, we want to see a bigger trial for sure, but and we're trying to tease out now, the research is trying to tease out what exactly was it about the diet that did that. But it, for me, it's quite simple. There was an absence of highly processed, um, highly processed refined foods, and um, you know whether it's carbs, protein, or fat it doesn't really matter. There was an absence of the of the you know the, the toxic, highly processed food, and there was uh, the abundance of this real diverse range of foods. Lots of different colourful fruits and vegetables. There was fish in there. I think there was a bit of meat in there. Um, but I think that you know, there was, you know the, the wild fish provided omega threes, which we know is good for our brain. But also the rich diversity of vegetables in there provides a lot of food for those gut bugs. So I really think, and, and you will know this yourself. You said I think to me once at the start, you know, suffering from anxiety. When you change your diet, you started to see a big improvement. Huge improvement. Yeah. Really yeah, quite quickly, so. Yeah, people aren't thinking about this. You know, when, when people go to see their doctors with anxiety, more often than not, I'm afraid, the doctor's not talking to them about their diet. And that's one component that absolutely needs to be spoken about in the context of this. On my Doctor in the House second series with Friends House on BBC One, and again, it's still available on YouTube if you look for it, you will find this episode. Mm -hmm. There was a lady who had severe panic attacks. It was impacting her work life, her social life, her personal life. And she had tried antidepressants. She had tried to see counsellors before, but nothing had worked. What we did, what I did with this, I took out a couple of things that were toxic and damaging her gut bugs, mm -hmm. and then we moved her diet to being a whole food, unprocessed diet. She had, you know, meat, fish, nuts, seeds, uh, fruit, vegetables, and no brain meals. It was all, um, you know, minimally processed, mostly home cooked meals. And again, that can be difficult for some people, but she got a 70% reduction in her panic attacks from, in, in about six weeks. Yeah. She'd been under doctors for 15 years. And I thought, this is absolutely incredible. The food we eat absolutely impacts our brain. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the number of matter for me also. That lady had had quite um, uh, a traumatic incident happen to her when she was 18 years old, mm -hmm. right? which, which everything, you know, everything started to go wrong from there. But what's interesting is that by changing her diet and her lifestyle, she got a huge improvement in her panic attacks. And now, and then she is able to engage with some psychological therapies to kind of address some of that underlying trauma. It's not either or, you know, very few conditions particularly mental health problems, have just got one cause. Mm. There are multiple factors going on. And, you know, diet and lifestyle is a huge part of them. So we absolutely need to be addressing that with all of our mental health patients. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's a bit of a rant there, but I feel really no, passionate about no, this. No, I do as well. Um, just from personal experience, like, um, from, the, like, the change in my diet was, like, oh, it just, I couldn't believe that I tried so many different antidepressants, anti-anxiety, drugs, um, all sorts of different things and felt like, okay, this is it. Um, and then just discovered a podcast episode, totally random, can't even remember. It was one of those ones that, you know, was suggested after you listened to another one and I thought, I just let it run on. And it, if I hadn't listened to that podcast episode, I do not know where I would be now. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons why I started this podcast um, just over a year ago uh, was that you know so hopefully someone even if it's just one person that listens to this episode and thinks you know that might be the missing part of a puzzle for me then it's absolutely worth getting this information out there good on you absolutely um, it really is um so i thought we could uh, finish up by uh just giving our listeners maybe one or two practical tips that they could put into place right now today 
to help reduce stress in their day-to-day life, perhaps they can implement it straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Well, if we take a day from start to finish, I'd say that one of, one of my top tips is to protect the first part of your day, even if it's just for five minutes or 10 minutes, just protect the first part of your day. Otherwise, you go into stress mode straight away. So just have a bit of quiet time, maybe put your phone on airplane mode, listen to a meditation app for 10 minutes, just do some deep breathing, something to start you off in the right frame of mind. I think that's incredibly powerful for many, many people. Mm-hmm. I think uh, at lunchtime, prioritize getting outside and having 15 minutes to yourself without a phone. I think that can be incredibly stress-reducing for many of us, just going having a bit of time to ourselves. You could go to a cafe, sit there, have your favorite hot drink, but just sit there. Don't be catching up on your emails and social media at the same time. Just be present. People watch. Have a bit of downtime. And then the final tip I'd probably say is at the end of the day, and obviously not everyone works and then comes home at the end of the day, but you know, just as a general rule, I'd say um, try and have some meaningful connection time with those people close to you. If you're lucky enough to live with someone else or a family, put your phone away and make sure at least 20, 30 minutes of that interaction time is when you're mindful and present. And if you live by yourself, maybe phone a friend and even you arrange to meet up. And it's these small things that add up to big changes very, very quickly. Yeah, totally. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Before we go, um, where this episode is going out in January. So um, for those, for our listeners that would like to be able to find out more about the book, The Stress Solution, or uh, anything else that you do, what, where's the best place to go? Yeah, so I'm very active on social media. I guess Facebook and Instagram are probably the two best places. It's at Dr. Chastity, which is D-R-C-H-A-T-T-E-R-J-E-E. Twitter, which I find quite an angry place these days, is at Dr. Chastity UK, but I am there as well. Um, If you want to find out more about the book, it's available in all the shops now on Amazon. But there's a a bit on my website, drchastity.com forward slash book, where you can read a bit of a summary and see if it's something that you feel might be relevant for you or, or your friends or your family. So those are probably the best ways uh, of staying in touch with me and finding out what I'm up to. I also, like you, have got a, uh, a podcast called Feel Better, Live More. Um, and like you, I'm trying to inspire people each week with interesting conversations so that they can uh, take control of their health. So yeah, any one of those ways would be great. That's great. I'll make sure that all the links to everything are in the show notes. So if you're listening, you can just scroll down on whichever device you're listening to and there'll be links there that you can click. But um, this, I guess all that's left to say is thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. I'm sure you're extremely busy. <laughs> hey, we all are these days. Thank you for inviting me and I very much appreciate uh, your opportunity to come and talk to all your listeners. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you again to Rongan for giving up his time to come onto the Ditch the Dyke podcast and tell us all about what he does and about his new book, The Stress Solution, which you can find right now on Amazon. I'll put the link in the show notes. So it's January. You're probably thinking about going back to the diet club or the slimming club that you went to last year and the year before that and the year before that. And I would like to give you an alternative to that this year. Um, and that is by means of the Ditch the Diet Academy. The Ditch the Diet Academy was something that I created to show you how to improve your relationship with food, quit dieting, lose weight forever and get your body confidence back. It's a step-by-step guide. Um, We have courses in there, community, accountability, motivation. We have a recipe database, meal planning system and a weight tracker and everything is under the one roof. If you would like an alternative to slumming clubs this year and if you would like to make some sustainable progress that doesn't require restriction or guilt around food, then you need to check out the Ditch the Diet Academy and you can do so by going to www.ditchthedietacademy.com and clicking on the Academy tab. I'll also put the link in the show notes so that you can go directly to find out more about it. We would love to welcome you as a member this January and I hope you will join us as an alternative to going back to your old slumming club that has not served you in the past. So let us take control for you and help you quit dieting forever. I hope to see you there. And if not, I'll see you in next week's podcast episode. Thanks for listening.